What's up guys? I'm going to show you how uh, to make some PALS webbing. At least I'm going to show you how I make PALS webbing. If you don't know what that is, it's a modular attachment system. You know, Molly has the vertical and the horizontal with the snap. This is the horizontal. It is the part that actually will sit on pouches that you're going to attach other pouches to. Why are we going to make this? Well, because we can make it out of Cordura. We can make it out of the same exact material so it matches and looks just like your pouch. Um, there's plenty of printed webbings out there. Uh, and they have their application. For instance, I'll use them for shoulder straps and things like that, especially if we need an adjuster, right? A piece of webbing that's gonna come up and down so that we need them on both sides. This is actually Cordura. We cut two inch wide strips of Cordura. We have a machine, um, it's actually a couple of pieces of machine that's been custom made and it pulls it through, folds it at the same time, applies a piece of edge tape on the bottom and double stitches it. And then it has another motor on the front with a roller that pulls it all taut at the same time. Then we go through and we put a center line in it. So basically it's three passes. We used to make all of this by hand and we would do it with five lines of stitching. That means we had to pass it back and forth five times to get each piece of material. You'll see people say all kinds of stuff like that's the cheap way to do it or whatever. The reality is it is the most difficult way to do it. And I feel that it gives you the best product. It looks just like the material that you're putting it on because it in fact is made of the material that you're putting it on. Um, use printed webbing if you like it, that's fine. A lot of the printed webbing we see fades. Um, it's just not as good, even though the numbers on it, the part number, the type of webbing, right? 17337, it is not as good. The printed webbing is not as good as the other webbings that we get from the mills. And I don't know why that is. They say it's the exact same stuff. It is not the same. It's not woven the same. It's almost like the material they make it out of is not even the same. So if I'm not running this through an adapter, for instance, in an adjustable shoulder strap, we make our webbing. And that's what I'm gonna show you right here for guys that are trying to make this. I've seen some conversations recently about how you do it. And I've seen a lot of opinions on it. And I've been doing this since 2001, 2002 probably. So chances are, um, as far as people that are watching this, um, I have been doing this longer than anybody you can possibly find to speak to that will speak to you about it. So I'm gonna show you how we used to do it. Um, and then I'm gonna give you some ideas on how you can do it. Uh, it is very, very labor intensive. Um, and I haven't done this in a, in years. We have a machine out there. I think it was 14 grand when we bought the machine. Um, so for the last, I don't know, seven, eight years, that's probably the last time I made a strip of this webbing. So I'm going to show it to you. Um, I'm going to show you how I build this. I had the guys cut me some of this and this is how we actually build our material in here, right? We cut these, we take off of a roll of Cordura and we cut two inch wide strips, which is what we have here. Now I've got a piece of multicam, a piece of multicam black, and a piece of Typhon. Um, oh, I have two strips each, I guess. And the multicam black has pretty good pattern on it, right? And you can see on, on the strip here, I just randomly grabbed a piece. Depending what you're building, we throw a lot of this away. So if I'm gonna cut a piece of, I don't know, pals on the side of a day pack, it's probably, four inches long to six inches long, depending where we're putting it. If I got to cut this from here to here, what's that, 18 inches? That's all trash. It's going in the, it's going in the dumpster. It's fine as black, but my customers want pattern content. Now, if you're building this for, for killers, right? Like guys that are really doing work around the world, they ain't gonna care about the pattern. But if you're building it lifestyle, your consumer wants pattern in his stuff, right? And Cryptek is the worst with it in Typhon. If we build, if we build 48 pieces of pals at a time, which is typically what we build, we literally put six of these things in the trash. Um, and then we'll have probably six out of that 48 that are so low pattern content that we might have five or six or three inch pieces out of here. We'll keep the ones with content for where we need them. Rest of it goes in the trash. It's just it's just where their pattern is. Now, when you look at Cryptek Raid, 
There's pattern all through it. We use all of it. When you look at um, multi-cam, I'm not sure where my other strip went. I thought I, I had it here. I don't know where it went. Everything here is camouflaged. It's all blending together. But when you look at uh, the multi-cam classic pattern, it's got pattern all through it. It's good to go. Uh, same with Woodland. It's multi-cam black and it's Typhon that are just lacking in pattern content when you build this stuff in runs. So we'll just jump into this right here. I got black thread on. I got multi-cam black right here. Um, you can go through and mark a line down here or mark dots to the center to fold to, but it's really not gonna matter. As long as you can hem by hand and keep it pretty consistent, then we're going to fold the other piece in. It doesn't matter if it's off center because we're going to cover it with a piece of edge tape. One inch, 50, 38 edge tape. Um, I have a couple of different, I have a soft edge tape and I have a stiff edge tape. The stiff is much better, um, but we only get it in black. I don't know why that is. Um, we've inquired over the years and we've only seen stiff in black. Uh, the multi-cam edge tape, the uh, printed edge tapes, they're even softer than the soft and it's it is one of the more difficult things that you will actually put on. Now on the back of these you don't need that so let me just jump in here and uh, see if I can make one of these. I haven't in quite some time. So I got a couple stitches in the material. I'm gonna pull back taut which is going to let me just push this down here and get it in place and then I'm gonna loosen, I'm gonna hold it here and here. I'm gonna pull, but I'm not pulling the work backwards. I'm kind of pulling opposite direction and letting the feed dogs pull this. And when you do that, it applies pressure. And as you see, this sits nice and flat here. It's not, it's not fighting. And as always, we're just gonna look at this as, you know, three, four inches at a time. We're not going to look at it as 58 inches. also they have some kind of attachment you can pass this through even if it folds both sides and you're only on a single needle machine it will be easier to feed it both through and wrap it at the same time even if you're only catching one um, and then maybe turn it around or whatever it'll be easier that way but run this through and now I'm kind of doing the same thing but I'm making sure this edge hits this edge That actually looks a little thin to me. A little in there. No, it's right at. Looks like it's right at one inch. Actually, looks it looks perfect. Yeah, it's perfect. All right, let's roll this through here. This side will take a little longer because you got to line it up to the other one. Also, if you're tracing this out with a Sharpie, um, make sure your Sharpie is consistent when you're lining this out and you know connecting your dots and making your lines to, to cut this with scissors. Um, because your Sharpie, if you start out with a very sharp Sharpie, it will get dull and as it gets dull, it gets wider. So are you cutting on the outside of the line of the Sharpie, left or right, or are you splitting it down the center? You need to be aware of that so that they are all consistent. You might build some that are perfect, and as you go down through the bat, if that Sharpie got dull, it, it will change. There's also other companies out there that were building gear. I don't even know if they are still around, but guys would take 
And instead of making this uh, two inches wide and edge taping the back, they would make it three, three and a half wide. They would fold this over one inch and then they would fold the other piece to the center and it actually had a hem. So they would do a very shallow, narrow hem on the, a, a small hem on the edge, fold this in one inch and fold the other and then catch it in the center. Uh, so you had like this bulk here. And uh, I was never a fan of that. Um, it's definitely, it's also more difficult, but I think that this is the cleanest product that you can get. But you can see here, like we were talking about, no pattern here. So if you're using it for something long, whatever, no problem. But if I'm using it for anywhere from, you know, three inch to 12 inch pieces and I need pattern, I would use this piece here and I would use from here to here. This would be trash, this would be trash. So just be aware of that. And that, that's only the issue, it's, that is only an issue on the uh, multi-cam black and the Typhon. And I don't, I don't know why that is, but. I've got some creases here. We'll just cut that off of there. Now you're putting a coarse piece of material on a pretty slippery piece of material. And then I'm going down here. I'm gonna to try to catch that same stitch back. So when this is done, it'll look like you have two lines of stitch. Except that once it's done, we'll go through and put one down the middle also. And all that does is it just, if you somehow cut that stitch line and that edge tape came off, you've got it holding in the middle also. And the truth is most of this, not all of it, most of your pals that's on the face of something, really it's, it's, it's there for looks nowadays. Our pals you can definitely attach things to. Um, if this was on the back and not shown though, we would just use webbing for it. It's a, it's a lot less labor. This takes a lot of time, uh, thus it takes a lot of money to make it, but it looks a thousand times better than putting webbing on. You're seeing so much of the gear industry uh, laser cutting things now, which is, which is fine. Um, there's a, a barrier to entry with the cost of the laser, but they have some small laser machines that you could get. Um, but the real reason people are doing it, it's not because it makes a better product. It's because you don't have to have skill and you don't have to put manpower into it. If you look at a lot of, I like to use the example of the chest rigs, the small modular chest rigs that are made out of laminate and all the pals is laser cut. You don't have to sew any of that on. You don't have to make pals. And if you look at those small rigs, there's only six pieces of stitching. Shoulders, where the shoulders attach, and the waist strip, uh, waist straps. That's literally six pieces of stitching, and it's all programmable tackers. The air clamp clamps down, push the button. It's like an embroidery machine. You don't have to be a skilled sewer to be able to build that. And that's, I think that's the appeal to a lot of people. If, if they don't have the skill, they can spend a little bit of money and be able to get kind of into that industry. Uh, the issue with that, and maybe it's not an issue at all, but you're not ever going to develop the skill if you're only a, bush, a button pusher. We hire, um, we hire women from Carhartt and uh, HIS, and chick jeans and you know they make DoorDash and Levi's and all kinds of stuff. We've had a lot of employees come through and they're like, oh yeah, I've sewn for 10, 15 years. And what we find coming out of the big factories, they are not skilled sewers. They're not skilled seamstresses. They're button pushers. They and they're like, yeah, I build, you know, 1800 pieces a day and they do. It's a programmable machine. They line the material up and it comes from one station to the next to the next. So they'll get these carts with bundles and the bundle might have a hundred pieces in it and they'll unbundle it and they'll just line it up, push, push it. It's about how fast you can put the material on and take it off and they're getting performance pay. So they get whatever their base pay is. And if they meet, you know, a thousand pieces, they get it up into a bonus. So they're really fast at this but when you put them on a sewing machine, um, if you're make, let's say you make belts or you make 
uh, pockets, right? You're, you've made some kind of tactical gear. If you hire one of these ladies, you're a better craftsman than they are, even though they've been in a sewing factory for 30 years, some of them. They don't have, because they just built, they, they do one thing and they actually bid a job. And they're sought after jobs because you can move faster and you can make more money on those jobs. That's not to say you can't teach them to sew. I taught myself to sew. I guess the question is, are we catch? Yeah, man, it's perfect. I really wasn't, I wasn't clear that that was gonna happen the first time. So with this, just ran out of thread. I'm gonna leave it attached, cut my bobbin, pull this off, pull the bobbin out of the bottom, rotate the hook a little bit till it clears, because sometimes the machine's tuned different. I'm gonna pull this thread out, right? I like to have my thread coming across the top of the bottom down, and you'll see, I'll pull machines out of girls, I'll pull bobbins out of machines, girl, out of machines, and they're flipped both ways. I always do it to the front. This little hook right here with the threads gonna clip under, that's facing towards me, the threads over the top towards me, put it in there, clip it in right there. Now I'm gonna pop that back in there. I'm gonna drop that needle to pick up that bottom thread. I'm gonna clear it out there with my um, scissors and hold it. You can use a screwdriver, whatever. I'm gonna go ahead and put this bobbin back on here. I'm gonna get three or four wraps around there because I pulled the tail along. I'm gonna take that long tail, pop it through there right and then I'm gonna come back several stitches here tack that first one or two I'm holding my tail on my bobbin now and I'm gonna start my sewing here I've got 20 or so turns holding the thread the tail has now come off now I'm going now when I'm pulling it I'm pulling this back and I'm also pushing this over it wants, because we folded it already under the first pieces of material, it'll want to kind of pillow up. You want it nice and flat. And there we go. I'll come back here and clean this up while I have it. This is in my hands. A lot of people you'll see in production or whatever, they'll take this and the first thing they'll do is cut that in half. Now you have two pieces to deal with. It's one piece right now. While I'm holding the thread, I'm pulling up on the thread, I'm pushing down with the scissors. I still have it in my hand, down with the scissors. Now I don't have to pick it back up or deal with smaller pieces. Same thing here. Now I'm gonna kiss both of those little stubs of thread with that lighter and I'm gonna smear them at the same time. That way your customer, when they get this product, they don't see those little threads, they don't start picking at it. If you have a thread hanging there and you start picking at it, you can get the next thread to come undone and before you know it, your customer thinks their product is unraveling. So if you burn that with a lighter and smear it in the direction of the thread, you're never gonna see it. All right, there's your PALS webbing. That's how we build PALS if we don't have a multi-thousand dollar machine. Do you like that? You should try building some. Once you build it and you're like, man, I don't have time to do this, maybe we'll sell it to you. I don't know. We build a lot of this. Maybe we'll start selling it by the strip. Okay, so there's that. Now let's start uh, with a very basic dual pistol mag pouch. Our dual pistol mag pouch consists of three pieces of Cordura. And here's, here's what I'm going to show you. And that's actually four and five. Because this is camo patterned, I'm going to make my lids also out of the same material. This is exactly how uh, Eagle made their mag pouches forever. And this is how I make mine. I actually changed mine and made mine a little smaller 
uh, just so the footprint was a little bit less. And what you have here is you have a six by eight piece of material, a six by nine piece of material, and a little bit smaller here. Now, when we started doing this, um, Eagle Industries was using 1650 ballistic nylon. All you really see now is 1680. It seems to be the same stuff. I don't know why they call it something else. We used to have 420 pack cloth, now all the pack cloth is 400. Um, what you're after is something stiff. You can totally use thousand inside. Um, Blackhawk didn't put anything inside theirs. And we've actually seen guys put like, I don't even know why they put it in there. They use like this open cell foam, like you wrap around glass when you ship it. It does nothing. Um, we've even seen we've even seen companies put terry cloth dish towels uh, inside to make padding and shoulder pads. It's it's ridiculous, but I guess most I would say 95% of your customer base in the world doesn't use their gear to failure, so they will never know that there's dish towel inside. So on the rack, it looks like a solid product. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do here, I'm going to take my liner piece, and I'm just going to sew this in half. You don't even have to catch the corners. And what I mean by that is you can just rotate it through like I just, you saw me do. I'm not precise on the corners. It's just about folding this in half. Every t the more stitching you put in something makes it more rigid. So there's that. The big piece is the base piece. And what I'm gonna do, I actually have my guys because our double, our triple, and our quad pistols are the same build. They're just a little bit different. The height is the same on all the pieces. The width is just a little bigger for one more cell. So I have them write a B and an F on these. And that tells me that this is the back and this is the front. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm just gonna hem this over. It's probably about 3 eighths of an inch. And usually, Usually when we're building these, we're building 12 or 24 pieces at a time. We just chain them all just like that. And then I come back and I separate them and put them in a pile. Now this is the back piece. I'm gonna sew it inside out and I'm gonna be about a quarter inch away from the edge. I'm gonna tack it there, I'm gonna rip it down here. I'm gonna tack it here just a bit and I'm gonna tack it here this way tack it here. Why did we just tack this? I'll show you why. Because we just did an inside out pocket. I'm going to turn it. I'm going to get in here and I'm going to push this corner. I'm going to flip that corner out as best I can. I'm going to get my finger in here. I use my middle finger. You use whichever one you want. I'm going to try to push most of that meat inside out like that. So there's our pocket. Okay. Now I'm going to take my scissors. They're pretty rounded here. They're not pointy scissors. And I'm gonna pop that out of there. Turn it out. That's why I sewed it back and forth in there and tacked it. So I can push those corners without busting through there. Now, I'm gonna take all this meat as best I can here and get that seam even, top and bottom. and I'm gonna overstitch this. I'm gonna tack that there. This foot's gonna catch there on that bulk for some reason, this machine always does that. See how it's just, it's sitting and moving. I gotta lift that up again, get that out of there. Same thing here. You can push down or whatever, but if you just pull this out and kind of push it at the same time, you'll get that seam to line up even. Now here, I'm gonna come on up. I'm pushing all, I'm pulling all this across, right? Because I want this pocket flat when it's done. Tack that right there. Now I'm gonna run right into the next piece and I'm just gonna do them all. I'm gonna separate them out. This is way fat, you are way faster to build three of these. It's way faster per unit than building the single. Okay, there's my pocket. Right? I'm gonna take this piece here and I'm gonna set this right inside here. I actually should have put this in before I sewed this. I really don't 
I build these pretty frequently. I don't know why I did that. Okay, we're still gonna save it. So, forget everything I just told you and put this in there before you sew that perimeter stitch, okay? Okay, okay? So, there's that. Still pretty darn clean, nice and flat. Four inches or 11 inch, 11 centimeters, right? So five and a half here. I just looking for a center. I'm gonna make two cells here. I'm gonna put a line down the middle. What this is gonna do is sew this, basically quilting that together, which you would have also caught them in the seams had I not, had I put that in there first like I should have. Okay, so there's that. Now, this is the front. You have a lot of ways you can do a pistol mag, but there's only so many ways. What I mean is most of your pistol mags, most of your dual pistol mags, if you look at the last 25 years, they're really all the same pistol mag. You can make some tweaks and kind of make it your own. What I'm looking at here is where is my pattern here? This one's about even, so it doesn't matter. But I'm gonna make a hem here. I'm gonna make a double hem, right? So fold it over, fold it again. Okay, if you can catch that all in one pass, like I'm doing right here, awesome. If you can't, then sew it once and then fold it and sew it again if you need to. What I'm after here, is I'm taking the raw exposed edge and I'm concealing the raw edge. It's tucked up inside. What I'm also doing is I'm making this more rigid here so that it holds its shape. When you take your magazine out and go to put your mag back, there's three layers of material right here instead of a single, and it gives it shape in the mouth of the magazine pouch. You can do this. You could use edge tape. Any place you have edge tape where a mag's coming in and out, where that locks into the, the pistol, right? If it's a metal mag, it will eventually rub something, uh, especially an AK mag, it'll just tear shit up. That's why I always roll to the outside, not to the inside. If this was a rifle mag pouch, an AK mag would te tear this, it would eventually tear the material, it would eventually eat the thread out of there. So now I'm going to hem this around the perimeter here. This is the front mag pouch that will become two mag cells. I'm gonna tack this here at the top, always tack it in. Even if we're running them in lines of dozens, tack it where you start and stop. It'll just prevent it from coming undone when you clip them apart to the next one. So here it is. I'm coming down before I'm to the edge. I folded my hem that I'm going to travel into. I'm going to turn 90 here, and I'm going to run right out of here. I'm slowing down. I'm starting to think about that next hem right here. Fold, whatever you want to call it. There's that. I'm tacked down. Needles down, I can turn wherever I need to now, works as the third hand. Pivots off of there, right here. I'm getting this set into place where I want it. I'm gonna bring it up. Now I'm gonna travel back a couple. Now I'm done. Now I can separate. While I have it in hand, threads, I'm just holding the thread, I'm pushing down with the scissors, leaving as little stub as possible. There's the front mag, there's the back mag. Now we're gonna make the lids. This is really gonna be just like the Powell's webbing I just showed you to make. Cody's gone ahead and put a line in it for me. Very nice. You will get to the point where you don't need a line. So, and how are you gonna do your line? Are you gonna to come to the left of the line? You're gonna conceal it, you're gonna come in the center. If you can do it right in the middle, baller, fucking good for you, craftsman. If you can't, then just come, just make it consistent. Are you filming 3,000 frames a second? You probably yeah. have to to catch that. Yeah. Okay. So here I've just changed straight into the next one here. Try to get it close to the edge. So when the product's together, it doesn't look like you've got multiple lines of stitching that are sideways, um, you know, next to each other, wonky. And while that looked like I'm in the center, as this comes out this side, You'll see that this side's bigger, this side's smaller. Not gonna matter. Not gonna matter at all. I'm pulling, I have that clamp down, right? The foot's holding it. I'm pulling this taut down and I'm, make, I'm walking this in. Because it's taut, it, it's easier to move to perfectly line it up. 
right there. Now I'm gonna roll right in to the next piece. Um, if you're building a quantity of these, something to think about also is you could just cut full strips of this, make your strips, and then come through and cut them to length, right? So our lids, if it's a fast text closure, my lids are gonna be 11 inches. If it is a Velcro closure lid, they're gonna be longer, right? We're gonna use, we're not just gonna have that buckle that overlaps, we're gonna have to have purchase. And I want three inches of Velcro contact minimum. My hard Velcro is gonna be three inches. My lid is gonna be 15 inches. John, why are you telling people how to build your product? Because most people won't. And if they do build the product, they're going to have a great appreciation for the price that we charge for this, right? If they are really honest with themselves and they paid themselves minimum wage, right? You're paying yourself minimum. It's not even worth you having it. But if most people work a job making $20 an hour or $15 an hour, these mag pouches are way too expensive for you to make. Now, if you're gonna start a business and you wanna know how to make my mag pouches, you're just gonna go buy one for $25 and you're gonna cut it apart. You'd be a fool not to. And I made 25 bucks, so. Okay, so there's those, we're tacked down. I'm not even gonna sew the middle. A lot of people put a lot of thread in their stuff and they have no idea why they do it. This has no load bearing capability at all. It doesn't need it in the middle. You wanna put one in the middle, more power to you. I'll show you how to do that without doing it right here. Okay, so now we're just gonna fold these in half and because these are Velcro lid mag pouches, I want these edges completely lined up, whether they were Velcro or not. I'm gonna travel right up here and you decide what you want this channel to be. Do you want your channel to be half inch? Do you want it to be one inch? Do you want to be the quarter inch guy because you're the only quarter inch guy in the industry? You have no idea what I'm talking about right now, but you will in a second, okay? So I'm gonna zip this across here. While I'm pulling down, I'm also pulling across. I don't want this to be pillowy. I want it to be nice and flat. Right Now I'm gonna run this right into the next one here. Now we're gonna conceal an inch of this, inch and a half of this almost, you're not even gonna see it. You can sew it across the bottom, you don't even have to do that if you don't want to. I do, because it just makes, a, it helps me get a little bit flatter. Don't need to move, you don't even need to clean those, you're not gonna see them. They're getting sewn inside the seam of the other piece. making this channel here. Why do I have that channel there? This is why. First, I'm looking at the lid. Where's my pattern content, right? Which piece am I going to see? This has the best pattern. I'm gonna put the Velcro on the opposite side because we're gonna cover that. And this is where it goes, that's the face. That's the part you're going to see of the mag pouch. I'm gonna put this right over there. And when I sew this, I wanna catch that same stitch line with this line. You don't have to. It just doesn't look as clean if you have multiple stitch lines. I have all the stitching. It's just in the same line. I'm gonna come right down here, right across here, right back in, and then right back where I started, okay? So from here, I'm just gonna sew across, tack it, and run right into the next one. Now, if you want that line in the middle, if you feel better about the line in the middle, sew halfway through that Velcro and run right down. And now you have a line in the middle, if that's what you want. A lot of, comp a lot of people do that, right? A lot of people put way more thread. They have no idea why they even do it. Most people do it, a lot of them, just so they can say, I have more stitching. I have more thread. I'm, I'm the dude with the more thread. Your Kona thread has about six miles of thread on it. When you're starting out, you will have a Kona thread for years. We go through, I don't even know, I think we get, I think we're getting 20 in a case of thread. I think we're getting 20 cones. We're going through 100 cones a week or so, like it's insane.
every time I move, every time I pivot, right? I'm pulling, stretching this flat. Get in the habit of doing that. If you do that equally to all pieces, all pieces will be flat and equal. I have that thread attached. I'm pushing, it's, it's attached to the machine here. I'm just pulling with the scissors, nip. Flip it over, pull with the scissors, nip. Push, pulling up, pushing down, pull down with the scissors, nip. It's all about cleanup. One second spent now will send you, save you five seconds later. And when you have hundreds of these movements a day, it adds up. And num more importantly, it, it builds consistency. Now, why did we leave that channel? This channel's here, so you have a pull tab. You can grab this. If it's Velcroed down, you can't get to it. But that's not much. No, it's not much. But you can put 550 through that channel. We see guys put bullet shells in here and tack these closed. We've seen, I mean, you name it especially the seals in amphibious environments, they're doing all kinds of shit. We saw guys with like, hell, I don't even know what it was. It looked like a cat turd. They're, the tails on those things were so big and braided 550. But this gives the end user the ability to do what they want. And if they do nothing, it still gives you somewhat of a purchase. Now with this gloves, especially wetsuit gloves or thicker gloves, you're not really gonna grab that. But you can run 550 through here, make a loop, and now you can grab it when you have less dexterity with bulkier gloves. That's why that's there. So those channels we built right here, I build all my stuff when I design mag pouches. My intent is that I don't have to measure these. I build everything that gets concealed an inch and a half. And I know that this webbing here is an inch and a half, so I can take this webbing and mark that, and I can take this webbing here and mark that. That will help you immensely when you're starting out because you don't have a dude that's standing there marking all this shit. You are that dude. So, the front side has all this badass pattern here. You're not gonna see it. So which side's better? I'm gonna put this on the back. I'm gonna put this on the front. I'm gonna pop this into this channel here. I'm gonna pop this into this channel. Even though you just saw me mark them equal, I'm gonna put this first one in here. I'm gonna tack that down, travel backwards, tack it down, travel, put this one right here. Look across, are they even? Even though you marked them the same, just look at them from here, make them even. Tack it right there. As always, push down, use, use the presser foot or the needle, use it as a third hand, right? There's that, okay. So, there's my center line because I already sewed it. Now, all I have to do here, I'm gonna find center right here. It's seven. You will get to where you can just look at this and know. You will get to a point where you can just be walking past some product five feet away and go, that looks like it's an eighth of an inch off. I always test myself just to make sure I'm always right, but every now and then I'll just measure it just to make sure that I am right. Um, burn those threads off while I got it, even though I'm going to over sew them. Okay, so I need some Velcro. These are, they look like three and a half. They are three and a half. This, now you can mark this, right? You can put a, a lot of dudes, I used to do this. I would find the quarter on the center, so I'd find half of this half right. So three and three quarter, two and three quarter, I'd go there and then I would mark, this is one and a half, so three quarter, I would do all this bullshit, right? If you're trying to find the center of material, just fold it in half. But wouldn't you be better off to just make a mark to the side and know what that is and just go to where you're not gonna conceal it and have to do all that shit? Or just trust yourself, right? Look at it, is it in the center? Yes, it's in the center. I'm gonna sew it right here, I'm gonna tack it. Come over here, needle all the way down, almost starting to come back up, make my 90. Same thing, same thing. Right there, okay? Now, I don't need to un unlock this right here. I'm just gonna sew, I'm gonna travel across that same line. The customer's not even gonna know that happened. I'm gonna run right into there because every time you move that thread, you have to cut two pieces and you have to hold it and pull it out and start again. If you just leave everything chained, you can run straight into the next product. When it gets in your way, separate them, 
leave it still attached to the product that it's in. You will spend more time pulling the thread out and starting and clipping thread than actually sewing. So do everything in a chain. So there's that. That's what that looks like. You want a line in the middle? Put a line in the middle. Why are you? Most guys have no idea. A lot of dudes, old school Eagle stuff, Blackhawk, London Bridge, um, they would glue shit down. Like they would have, and here's why, because you get a huge tax advantage by hiring disabled people, whether it be mental or physical disabilities, you will make way more money by hiring them on the back end when you're doing multi-million dollar contracts, when you have that revenue, you get a huge tax advantage by hiring them. So you create jobs for them and they will glue stuff or staple stuff in place. And you can also use less skilled labor assembling it because it's already in place. They don't have to do any of the measuring. So a lot of old Eagle stuff, it was glued on there and then sewn. Why? Anytime we used anything that was glued, we used to have guys bring stuff in for modifications and um, repairs and stuff. That needle going through that glue, it wreaked havoc, man. It was always a mess. It was always gumming shit up, but they did. So. You want a center line in this? More power to you. So where am I gonna start this? Am I gonna start here, here? Start it wherever you want. Line it up on the bottom. And when you're learning to do this, you might not wanna start from here and move down. You might wanna actually start edge to edge because you're gonna have some, some pull and it's gonna travel. I'm gonna go right here, I'm gonna tack it, I'm gonna rip it back. So there's the second, here's the third tack in there. I'm gonna run it right up here. Just pass, tack that in good. Travel that same line. We used to sew all these pistol mags. My, I just cut my thread. We used to sew these things five times. Why? I don't know why. Because I was the lot of thread guy. Because I didn't trust my, trust your, trust your thread. We don't have products nowadays that are not good. If your machine's lock and stitch is good and your tension's good, you could tack the bottom, tack the top. I've never seen these come out. We've never in 35 years, we have, I mean, I can't even tell you how many thousands of these we have out there. We've never had a pistol mag come in for repair that's come apart. It's just never happened. So I'm gonna come here. I'm going to travel from the top down because it's easier for me than, uh, than sewing on the inside of this machine. I'm gonna tack it right here. I'm gonna start, I'm not gonna sew at the top edge. I'm going to start right here, tack it. Now I'm going to travel back because it's already locked. Tack that in. And I'm just going to sew. I'm holding this in place so it's even on both sides and the bottom. Now your machine could push this. If I needed to stretch it, I could pull the material and get another quarter, half inch out of it. I don't need to. I'm holding it in place here so that it doesn't stretch it down. Now I'm there. I'm going to tack that right in there. I'm going to cut all that off, make my threads as small as possible. You hear me say that all the time. If you sew, you're like, John, shut up. If you sew, this video is probably not for you, right? This is a pretty basic product. This is for all the other guys watching this. It's also for my customers so they can have appreciation of what's actually done here. Find me a dude that works at one of these bigger companies that will, number one, sit down and actually show you and number two, that could actually sew. Like most of the guys running these companies, there are so many sew shops out there. So many guys that are just screaming from the rooftops made in America, but you never see a single sewing machine. You see one or two. You don't see a factory, you don't see people. We do live feeds. We build everything that happens right here under this roof, from raw goods to cutting, to sewing, quality control to shipping, everything happens in this building. So there's that. Now this is a very simple mag pouch. I'm not going to make pleats on the vertical. I'm just going to kind of catch where this Velcro sits about even. And I'm gonna kick these in just a little bit, but I want them to look the same on both sides. So I'm gonna come, rather than starting at the edge and catching this bulk, I'm gonna actually start in the bulk and I'm gonna sew backwards so it locks that down. And I'm gonna sew across it. Now it can't move. Now I'm gonna tack it across. 
just like that. Now I'm going to make this side <clears throat> look. <clears throat> I'm going to make this side look just like that side. Now, you could scale this up and make it a rifle mag pouch. But a loaded M4 mag weighs one pound. I don't want that sitting on just this single layer of Cordura. Strong enough for most people. But if you have a lifetime warranty, sooner or later, you're gonna have some of that stuff come in punching through that. So we don't make our rifle mag pouches that way. These are our pistol mags here. You wanna make them dual layer? You can, you don't need to. So the mag sits here. What it also does is when you pleat just the bottom, instead of making a boxed pouch, you pleat just the bottom. Your magazine sits here, so you've got about three quarters inch of dead room here. If you do that on a rifle mag, it adds quite a bit to it, um, and it's a it's a possible failure point. So there's that. Um, I completely forgot to put any kind of attachment on here. So I'm going to go ahead and show you how we make our attachments. You see a lot of companies' attachments. You can do a lot of things. Most guys are making modular stuff now, and if you're laser cutting, they don't really have to do anything. They just, the laser cuts it and they weave some, some Velcro one wrap or whatever through there. These are belt attachments. This is our one inch webbing, it's 16 inches long. I'm gonna put two inch Velcro, I'm gonna conceal it. So I'm gonna make all of these folds here one inch. I'm gonna start for the one inch fold. I'm gonna tack it right here. A lot of companies that put belt loops like this or used to, I don't know who's doing what now, um, they would use single layer material. We always made our belt loops and still make our belt loops dual layer because the more stitching you put in two pieces of material, the stiffer the material gets. The more stitches you put, the smaller stitches are a lot more stitches per inch. It also makes it a little stiffer. So. There's that. A lot of guys will just use a 8 inch piece of material of webbing and that's their belt loop. I just feel like this is just more stable. It always has been. Um, so there's that. And then our Velcro. I've got four pieces of hook, two pieces of loop. They're two inches long and they're all one inch Velcro. Let me show you what we do here and why. They obviously Velcro to their cells, but what's that extra piece for? You can try to catch this at once, right? If you even it all up, you can do all of this in one pass, right here. I'm not gonna, I'm gonna I wanna be over the material and I'm gonna drive that needle through the material. Otherwise it's gonna shift it, right? So there we go, I'm gonna go ahead and separate this, get it out of the way. I'm gonna line all of these up, make sure I'm even. There's that, okay? Here's the other way to do it, I'll show you. I like to travel into another piece of work rather than cut the thread. If you get that in your head, it will save you thousands of hours of your life if you do this for a long time. Okay, the other way to do it is to sew just the single, right? Go ahead and separate it, get that out of the way. And then put the hook on the inside, right? So you put your other side there. I'm gonna go ahead and get these threads out of here so I don't have to fight them. Lock it, tack it in, okay? That one's done. Now let me put this one here. I'm gonna travel right into this one. I'm applying downward pressure on the Velcro so it doesn't shift. And now here, am I even? If I'm not, I can kind of pull it in place here if I need to. I'm downward, I'm just holding it. I'm out of bobbin. If you're sewing this and your needle goes past the work, just make your, especially if you're doing a bunch of them, just make your stitches a little smaller. If it's fallen too short, make it one click bigger. You, you'll be okay. 
Nobody will notice it, but it will make your machine uh, work where you want it to and you won't have to fight it all the time. You won't have to adjust it on every piece. One, two, three, four, couple good wraps. Pull that long tail through there. Long tail's easier, you won't have to try to grab it later. Make sure it didn't lock on the top, but it pulled it out the bottom, so get that out of there, otherwise it's a rat nest later. Grab this tail over here on the bobbin, let that roll, make my turn. Now I've ripped that off of there, off the bobbin. Pass that same line, there we go. So, everything's attached, cut my threads, pull push, same time. My thread over here broke off, but not, I still have a tail. Now I'm gonna fight this short tail over here. Okay, so these belt loops are done. Well, I've got them right here. Especially if you're a one-man shop, you don't have a cleanup guy, right? Like we have guys that stand and all they do is clip and clean um, and mark things and put grommets and put buckles on. You, you probably don't have that guy. So I'm going to just pull it over about a stitch worth, drive it in, and lock it there. Okay, when I sew these belt loops on the back of this, I use two inches. So these are right at eight, so I'm going to make a mark here and here. That's two inches in the center. I'm not going to measure every piece. I build a master when I need to and I hold it up to the next ones and just mark off of there. If you're measuring everything, holy shit, are you wasting time. Now this, where are we gonna put this? I want this right here, right? And how do, why did we do all this? What's that extra piece, right? So this Velcro's here and here. That's my belt loop. This hook Velcro, hard piece, hook, scratch, whatever. This locks to the Velcro on the inside of my belt. This locks around. Now your belt is here. This is against your body. Your mags are here. This is never coming off of here. You get in a tussle even. If somebody rips this off of you or gets this off of you, if it gets snagged, you're gonna have a hell of a bruise on your body if you get this off. That's, that's why they're double layer. They're a little stiffer. They lock. Guys are like, what's the Velcro on the inside of the belt? Do I need the liners? You gotta ask, you don't know. Because if you had gear you're putting on that belt, you would know that it's opposing. Why does that have the Velcro? Keeps it from sliding around on your belt. It's gonna lock where you put it. It's gonna be there literally until you take it off. Now this, I would sew on. There's my two inch mark. This happens to line up perfect right there. I actually like these a little bit higher, so I start mine about a quarter inch off the bottom. And I would sew this, I'm not cutting this back apart. I would sew it one, two, three, down, one, two, three, up, over, and tack it maybe one, even two. So that's how I would do it. A lot of guys box X these. Why are you box Xing it? When you see box Xs on work from a factory company it's because that's what the programmable tacker does it does the box x you guys have no idea why you're doing it if you're going to do that i talk typically about leading edge right leading edge that would be the part that's most likely that's going to catch the most force right so if i was going to sew this on a programmable tacker would sew this on like this it would go one it's going to be nine stitches it would go one, two, three, four, back over is five, and then we're gonna do the X. Six, seven, eight, nine. So you're gonna have three lines of stitching here, you're gonna have two here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So you get three here and you get two here. 
That's how that programmable tacker program is typically going to sew. You could probably set it up to do so, but that's how they come. You don't need it. I would go one, two, three, over, one, two, three, up, and then back over. And that's how I'd lock those in. That's your dual pistol mag. You can make a hundred different pouches to carry any number of things. You're basically going to build it that way. Now, if it was a single pistol mag, you don't have to make the bat, the back plate and the lid you can just use inch and a half webbing that can all be one piece you could do it out of webbing or you could make your webbing to color match and then just sew a single cell on there it's a lot less work that way and that's a dual pistol mag and i showed you how to build the pals webbing we make these literally every day we have dozens of colors we've got four different combinations you can do velcro or fast text you can do belt attachment like I showed you, or you can use modular PALS webbing. You can attach it with your flavor of whatever, malice clip, soft ties, whatever you use. So that's four part numbers, and we build them in probably 20 colors. So 80 part numbers just in dual pistol mags. And then we do the same thing in single, uh, triples, and quad pistol mags. Um, and then we any number of things. We've got several flashlight pouches. We've got all kinds of multi-tool pouches. We've got, um, you name it, we make a pouch for it. That's how you would build it. And if you don't want to build it, SOE Tactical Gear, we sell them. And if you, you should really try to make PALS webbing the way I showed you. And if you're like, I don't want to do this, hit us up. We can discuss, maybe we'll, if enough guys want it, maybe we'll run it through our machines and start producing that for you guys on a, on a small basis. But uh, SOETacticalGear.com, this is how to make gear. This is how I make it. Um, I'm sure there's a hundred other ways you can do it. And uh, I do a lot of different content. I'm on Instagram, I'm on Facebook, I'm on TikTok, 4.30 every morning. Uh, we post other things. Um, our gear, we sell direct to consumer and I employ between 20 and 30 employees and it ebbs and flows. No matter what that number is, we never can build enough stuff. So if I can sell 50 pieces of something, we only build 40. There is always urgency and our stuff sells out. If you're waiting to, uh, um, I might buy that next week, it'll be gone. Everything we build sells out the same day. And if you really want product, I have a text app that goes out every day, shows you a few things that we made. And then we have an email list that goes out Thursday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Um, so get on those. And when you see that stuff, it's usually sold out in five, 10 minutes. I do a live feed every night at nine o'clock. We can talk about whatever you want. It can be politics, it can be homesteading, it can be sewing, it can be just business design, uh, whatever you wanna talk about. And I walk around the building and show you what we're building. And for guys that want the product, more importantly for those guys, as I walk around the factory, you see what's on the sewing machines that will come be done tomorrow or the next day. And you know about that stuff. And those guys typically, after I get off the e after I get off live, I go from nine to 10, 1030. Um, and then I check emails that night later. Guys email me, hey, can I get one of these things? I know it's not ready. And then a lot of times I'll just put one in inventory and just send them the link to it and they're sure to get it. If you want the product, there are ways to do it. If you wanna just be able to buy the product whenever, you're probably not gonna get the product. And that's just, that's 35 years of doing business. I have more customers than I have product capability. And I've designed my life at this point to be, I only do things I want to do. I still like doing this, that's why I do it. I don't need to do this anymore. We have a lot of other things going on uh, and I have built everything I enjoy doing into my business as my lifestyle and my lifestyle is my business. And if you can figure out how to do that for yourself, you will never dread going to work. There's never a day that I wake up and go, oh man, I have to go to work. I got the coolest job in the world because I have built it that way. So. Hope you learned something. Uh, entertain, educate, equip. Number one, I'm going to entertain you. You just watched this or a part of it. If you weren't entertained, you wouldn't have watched it. Educate, I'm gonna teach you how to do something. I'm gonna say something. You're gonna to try to prove me wrong perhaps and you're gonna look it up and find out that I was right. If I wasn't right, tell me. I'm, my, I'm, my mind is changeable. Um, and then equip, call to action. If you are building content 
or sending an email or whatever, and you're not, don't have a call to action, you're failing, right? And what that is, is I'm going to equip you. I'm going to sell you my product, or I'm going to ask for your email, or I'm going to ask for your like, or I'm going to ask you to share some call to action. I need you to do something for me for everything that I do. And hopefully I have entertained you or I've educated you. And I asked that if you got, if you laughed about this or you found it fascinating, or I hate this guy's beard, look at this guy's beard, check it out, do you agree with me? Send this to somebody, share this, right? Send it to somebody and go, hey, I thought this was an interesting sew video. Hey, I think this guy looks stupid. You know, go make fun, whatever. Do something for me, that's my call to action. Entertain, educate, equip.